Praise the Lord. God bless everyone. God bless our pastor here. Maybe I'll talk with you again. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the strength you're giving your people. Thank you for listening ears, obedient hearts. Lord, I pray your touch will come upon everyone in Jesus' name. That as your word goes out, and as we receive your word, we receive great anointing for success in ministry. Here, there, everywhere, everyone connected, will connect your power in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. you can see that we're coming back again to Jonah chapter 1. And this time we're reading the latter part of chapter 1. That's chapter 1, verse 15, verse 16, and verse 17. It says, so they took up Jonah and he cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. Then in verse 16, it says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. They made their consecration and their commitment unto the Lord because of the great things they have seen. Now, we need to understand when we hear the word of God, the word of God can lead us to consecration and to making vows. When we see the sight, a sight we never expected, we experience something we never expected. That experience also, apart from preaching, apart from declaring the word, apart from the exposition of the word of God, the experience alone by itself can lead us to consecration. That is, that's why it says, knowest thou that the goodness of God, the miracles of God, leadeth thee unto repentance. Now in verse 17, it says in verse 17, now the Lord hath prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Number one, is that a true story? Yes, it's a true story because Jesus Christ, the personification of the truth. Jesus Christ that knew the Old Testament and the New Testament and he came because he was the word, the word personified. He corroborated and said in Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 39, Matthew Chapter 12, I'm looking at verse 39, and he answered and said unto them, An evil generation seeketh a sign after a sign. So it said, There shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. That's Christ talking. That Jesus talking, that the truth personified talking, and he said, There is the sign of Jonah. Look at verse 40. It says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, there was no doubt in the minds of the disciples of the Lord when they listened to Christ. They said, Christ said, Jonah lived at the time, Jonah existed. Jonah was thrown into the sea, and Jonah was swallowed up by a whale. And that Jonah spent three I said so. It, it tells us the story is true. Not only that it's true, that it's a representation of what will happen to him. That as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so... Say, son of man, shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Verse 41. In verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jesus said, Jonah eventually went to Nineveh. Jesus said, Jonah preached in Nineveh. 
Jesus said, Jonah, when he preached, it was effective there that the people of Nineveh, that they actually, they repented. And then he said, behold, a greater than Jonah is here. A greater than Jonas is here. Now, what we're talking about today now is the new realization of the old revelation. The old revelation, that is, the revelation of Jonah. That Jonah actually, that Jonah died. So that Jonah went into the whale's belly. And that Jonah came up again and he went to and he said, as Jonah was in the whale's belly, even so, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. One that reveals that what was done in the Old Testament, revealed in the Old Testament, became realized in the New Testament. And this is not the only time. Because Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, telling us again that event in the Old Testament actually became realized of Christ in the New Testament. He says, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up that on the cross of Calvary, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We're talking to you about today about the new realization, New Testament realization of the old revelation. Also, something revealed in the old and realized a new in the new, the New Testament. We divided the message to three parts. Number one, the great reclamation of Jonah reaffirmed. The great reclamation of Jonah reaffirmed by Christ. Number two, the glorious resurrection of Jesus revealed. And number three, our gracious redemption with justification. That is now realized. One, reaffirmed. Two, revealed. Three, realized. One, the great reclamation. Two, the glorious resurrection. And three, our gracious redemption. Let's come to number one. Number one is the great reclamation of Jonah, now affirmed and reaffirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. This were divided into three parts. Number one, number one, the great weight and the will for Jonah's recovery. Number two is the great wonder and warning from Jonah's record. And number three is the great word and worth of Jesus' reaffirmation. Number one, the great wind and the great will for Jonah's recovery. Everything God does for one person, for one nation, for the whole world, everything Jesus, uh, God does, whether in the old or in the new, everything Jesus, God does in uh, providential events and in prophetic affirmation. Everything he does is for a purpose. And everything that we have seen in Jonah chapter 1, the will, the wind, the storm, the marina spring, everything, and the response and reaction of the Almighty God to that was for a recovery of Jonah. How good God is that God can take every event that appears negative, every event that goes downward, every event that appears reversing what He had proposed or planned. How good our God is that everything in your life, everything in my life, Everything that comes around, everything that goes without expectation, that everything can be reconstrued, 
reconstructed by God for your recovery, for my recovery, and for the recovery of the runaway prophet, the prodigal prophet. We're looking at this from Jonah chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea for a purpose. He had one man, one man there who should not be there. One man on the sea who should not be there. One man going the wrong direction that shouldn't be going that direction. And because of that, he acted. That's how he always act. He will always act because of the church. He will act because of his man. He will act because of his servant. And because of that, he sent out a great wheel into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the sheep was like to be broken. Now, in verse 17, in verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great feast. Look at that word prepared. He knew ahead of time that Jonah will go the wrong direction. He knew ahead of time that Jonah will disobey, that Jonah will rebel, that Jonah will resist the will of God and the call of God. And because of that, he prepared a great fish. Nothing takes God by surprise for us. Or children of men, for us creatures, might wonder, how did this happen? How could that happen? And we're not prepared for those events. But you never take God by surprise. He knew that Jonah will do what he did. So he prepared a great fish to swallow up. That will swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then we look at Psalm, in Psalm 148. Reading from verse 8. Psalm 148, verse 8. There was um, a class of young people. And then the teacher was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. And he didn't believe in the Bible. And so the teacher said, I'm going to ask you a question. And so the children were ready. And they said, do you believe that there was a Jonah? And that Jonah got into the whale's belly. And uh, so all those children were intimidated. They were afraid. Nobody raised up their hand. And then the little girl raised up their hand. He said, yes, I believe that Jonah was swallowed up by great will. And then the teacher said, what if that is not true? And the girl said, when I get to heaven, I will ask him. And the teacher then said, what if he's not there in heaven and you don't see him to ask him? Then the, the girl said, then you will ask him on the other side. <laughs> and that stops the mouth of that teacher. There is heaven, my friend. There's God, and Jonah eventually is there. When you get there, you'll ask him. You'll not ask him on the other side because he's not on the other side. <laughs> and so it says in Psalm 148, verse 8, fire and hail, and snow, and vapor, and stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Fulfilling the word of the Lord. The great wind, the great whale, fulfilling the word of the Lord. Look at number two here. In number two, we're looking at the great wonder and warning from Jonah's record. In Jonah chapter 1, Verse 17 again, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That's Jonah's record. And it's a wonder that something like that will happen. God is full of wonders. His wonders are there to help and to heal his own people. 
His wonders are there to hurt and to destroy the people who are not on the side of God. The wonder of God is like a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it heals, it helps, and it delivers those who are the people of God. On the other hand, it hurts and destroys those who are against God. We can see that in Exodus. The wonders of God dealt with Pharaoh. That's negative. The wonders of God dealt with the magicians. That's negative. The wonders of God dealt with every household in Egypt. On the negative side, the wonders of God, on the other hand, delivered the children of Israel. The wonders of God performed miracles and healed all of them. And there was not one feeble person among all their tribes. The wonders of God walks this way and walks that way. That's what we're told in Job chapter 9, reading from verse 4. Job chapter 9, verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength who has hardened himself against him and has prospered. And then he tells us in verse 8, it says, Which alone spreadeth out the heavens and, treat, uh, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Now verse 10, verse 10 says, Which doeth great things past finding out. He doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. And wonders without number. Nebuchadnezzar has this to say in Daniel chapter 4, reading from verse 37. Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at verse 37. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride is able to abase. Those that walk in pride able to abase. That's number two. Let's look at number three. Number three here, the great words and worth of Jesus' reaffirmation. As we have read this story of Jonah in the Old Testament, now we come to the New Testament and Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, the one, the, even the Pharisees, they came and they wrote, uh, uh, the people of Herod, they said, we know that thou teachest the truth and that you are no respecter of any person, wherever you are, whoever you are talking to, whatever subject you are talking about, you always declare the truth. Now, here is the one that declared the truth. The truth about the past, Old Covenant, Old Testament, Jonah, Moses, and the rest of them, the truth about the present, when he told the Jews and the people, ye of your father the devil, at the present time, he told the truth, and the truth about the future, which is prophetic. So, whether it is past or present or in the future, Jesus always told the truth. And the truth of what he told comes out in Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 40, the great word. And the great worth of Jesus' reaffirmation of the truth. He said, For Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights and the heart in the dead of the heart. That's the very truth, but in that was also predicting his resurrection. It tells us in Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 21, uh, it says in Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. It tells us in John chapter 5, reading from verse 37, 39. In John chapter 5, verse 39, search the scriptures, search in the Pentateuch. 
search in Genesis. You'll find something in Genesis about Christ. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman that will boost in the seed. Search the scriptures in Exodus and you'll find about the lamb. And there is the lamp of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And search in Deuteronomy, you'll find a prophet like unto thee, I will raise up unto them. I'll put my word in his mouth. And whosoever will not listen to that prophet at that time, I will require each of him search in the Psalms. And you'll see my God, my God, why he has not forsaken me search in Isaiah. You will see that surely he bore all our our trespasses and all our gifts, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Search in the Old Testament, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Everywhere you go in the Old Testament, search the scriptures. You'll find they testify about him. Look at chapter 24 of Luke, reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 24, verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things, notice that, all things, things, notice that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses one part and in the prophets another part and in the Psalms another part concerning me. Have you seen the division of the Jewish scriptures there of the Old Testament there? It says things written and recorded in the law of Moses. Exodus, Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, they told me everything written there concerning me. He knew they were written concerning him. And then he said, in the prophets, the prophets are divided into two, five major prophets, and then 12 minor prophets. All the things that were written, the prophets, major and minor, they're written concerning me. And then the Psalms, the books of wisdom, Job, and the Psalms, and uh, also Proverbs, and the song of uh, Solomon, as well as Ecclesiastes, all those things that were written in the Psalms and the books of wisdom, they written concerning me. And he said everything, every jot and every title of things written concerning him must be fulfilled. Praise the Lord. And so he knew that these things were written concerning him and they were told in verse 45 that he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's very significant. Before Paul saw, before he came to the Lord, he read the Old Testament. He read through from cover to cover. He never saw Jesus there. That's why he persecuted those believers. He went to their houses, went everywhere, and persecuted them. All of a sudden, he became converted. All of a sudden, the Lord appeared to him, and he said, what would you have me to do? Go to Damascus. It will show you. They will show you what you'll do. He became so converted, and when his eyes opened and the scales came off, his eyes before he went anywhere, he picked that same old, uh, old Testament and he preached concerning Christ because the coming in of Christ had opened his understanding that now he understood the scriptures. What did they understand when they saw the scriptures? Look at verse 46. It says, and said unto them, this, thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise again the third day, the third day, the third day. And then in verse 47, he declares and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Let's come to point number two here. Point number two here is the glorious resurrection of Jesus that is now revealed from the account of Jonah. From the record on Jonah, from what is written concerning Jonah, and from the fulfillment of the Lord Jesus Christ, we we'll see the glorious resurrection of Jesus clearly revealed. It tells us once again in Jonah 
chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and uh, three nights. And we've read already in Matthew chapter 12 uh, how Christ reaffirmed that and connected that with his own death burial and resurrection three things we're looking at here number one the prediction of the resurrection of jesus number two the purpose of the resurrection of jesus number three the power of the resurrection of jesus number one the prediction of the resurrection of the lord jesus christ matthew chapter 12 reading from verse 40 for as Jonas was three days and three nights in a whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 22. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 22. Here is Jesus Christ reaffirming that he will rise again on the third day, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things, must suffer because the Father had ordained it, because our redemption needs it, and because it is written already concerning him, must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be slain and be killed and be raised the third day. Every time Jesus spoke about his death, he also spoke about his resurrection. He must be killed, he must be buried, he must be raised the third day. Look at verse 44 now. In verse 44, let these sayings sink down in your ears. He was telling his own disciples, about his death, don't brush it up. Let these sayings sink into your ears. That's the one thing they didn't have in their ears sinking in. Why? Because they were expecting a reigning Messiah. They were expecting a ruling king. They were expecting a royal personality. They were not expecting a Messiah that will die be buried, and then we're waiting for his resurrection. They forgot Genesis about the crucifixion. They forgot Exodus, the lamb that was slain. They forgot Leviticus, that the blood would give him for atonement. And they forgot everything that had been revealed in the book of Moses, in the prophets and in the law. And because of that, the thing did not sink deep into their ears. And they heard many times what Christ had said about his atoning death and about his redeeming blood and about his transforming resurrection. And yet, it was like they never had. It's like that with many of us. We've heard, we've heard, we've heard over and over again. And then when the robber meets the road, and when the event really happens, that we can apply the prediction, the prophecy, the promise into our lives, we've forgotten. That's why Jesus said, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. And then in verse 45, but they understood not the saying. And it was hid from them that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that saying. But why should they fear? That was the most important thing they should have asked. They asked about the tradition of the elders. They asked what the Jews did, what they did. They asked why John's disciples, why they do this and why they do that. All those things, very important, very good. But the most important thing, they should have asked the Lord. They didn't ask. Believers behave sometimes like that today. The things that are very important to their salvation, 
to their justification, to their glorification, to their living with Christ and going with him to heaven about the rapture. They'll not ask about that. They'll ask about temporal things. They'll ask about unimportant things that do not have anything to do with their lives. They feared to ask him of that saying. But the point is, Christ predicted his resurrection. And as he predicted, so it happened. Look at number two here concerning uh, the glorious resurrection. Is the purpose of the resurrection of Jesus. The purpose of the resurrection of Jesus. Why did he die? Why was he buried? And why did he rise again? We're looking at Acts of the Apostle chapter 4, reading from verse 10. In Acts chapter 4, verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, and whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Look at the resurrection of Jesus because of that death, because of that burial, and because of that resurrection, the power of God came and healed people even after he had gone back to heaven. Well, that, that's one thing we know about the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask the question, is Christ still alive today? We say yes. How do you say that convincingly? Because his name, after he died, buried, and was raised from the dead, and he went to heaven, the name of the risen Christ healed the sick, raised the dead. He must be alive. We have not found any other name. Those who have died, and then you use the name of the dead, and then miraculous things will be happening. He said, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised him from the dead. Even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Then in verse 11, he says, this is the stone which was set at naught of your builders, which is become the hedge of the corner. And now this important verse, verse 12, assures us neither is there salvation in any other. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must will be saved. Look at chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 30, chapter 5 of Acts. Reading from verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged, on a tree. And then in verse 31, him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. That's why the important, the resurrection of the Lord is so important. The purpose is to give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. In chapter 3, verse 19, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 26, it says unto you first, God, having raised up his son, having raised up his son, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that makes us to have the salvation, the conversion, the justification, the transformation, because he sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. We're looking at number three here. Number three is the power of the resurrection of Jesus. The power of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Christ died 
And the Bible says we identify with him and we died with him because he was our substitute. In dying that death on the cross of Calvary, he was buried for us, for our sake. We identify with him. And then he rose again and we identify with that resurrection and that identification with the death of Christ and that identification with the burial of Christ, the identification with the resurrection of Christ actually brings power into our lives, heaven into our soul, and it brings transformation into our lives. What we couldn't achieve or do by ourselves, our faith in the resurrection of the Lord will do it. Look at Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection as I identify with him that I may know him that I may experience him, that I may receive from him the transforming power of his resurrection. I tell, look at uh, Romans chapter, uh, chapter 6, we're reading from verse 4. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, therefore we're buried with him, identification by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up, but from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we also shall walk in newness of life. The new life will be so different from the old life, like the risen Christ was very different from the Christ that walked the streets of Nazareth or Capernaum. Let me explain. When Christ was here on earth to enter any room, he'll have to knock the door, they'll have to open the door, they have to lead him there. Then he died and then he rose again and the doors were closed. They were shut because of the fear of the Jews and Jesus Christ will enter through those closed doors and says, peace be unto you. That means then totally different. Now on this other side of rest resurrection and when we totally identify with him the power that works in our lives transforming power the kind of power irresistible power the kind of power that is able to stand and able to penetrate everywhere that power comes and our lives now are so different from our lives before we met Christ just like the risen Christ was different from the power was different from the power when it was here on earth that now we identify with this resurrection and we now shall walk in newness of life. It tells us in chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you think about that the spirit holy ghost that raised up jesus from the dead remember that they buried him and they rolled on the stone and the soldiers were watching and the spirit of god broke through all that the soldiers the stone and went there and raised up jesus christ and the word of god says the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in our mortal body. One thing is very clear. If we allow him, the spirit, the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost to dwell inside us, that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelling in us, sickness will vanish away. All the weaknesses, I can't stand up, I can't sit down. If I sit down, I can't stand up. If I stand, I can't sit, I can't see, I can't hear. All the nerves and everything, it's like they have gone out of order, out of function. The spirit will come in and revitalize everything in your body in Jesus' name. And it says, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Think about that. On one occasion, on that unique occasion, 
The spirit of God went there and raised him from the dead. That spirit does not come and go, but now he resides there. He dwells in us, and he dwells in us forever. In the day and in the night, in the rainy season, in the dry season, in the open, in the, you know, in the shade, that spirit of God dwelleth in you. A miracle must always happen in your body. Let's look at First Thessalonians, and I'm reading from chapter 4, reading from verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 14. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, he died, that's not the end. Don't stop your story, don't stop your understanding, don't limit your faith to his death on the cross. He died and he rose again. Even so, them also we sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In verse 15, it says, For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, precede, or hinder them which are asleep. In verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then in verse 17, and we which are alive, remember, it's all by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You need a greater amen than that because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth while you are here while you are ministering the spirit that raised him up will dwell in you and there will be a daily miracle a daily revival a daily resurrection a quickening in your body and then on that final day because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ there will be the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the saints. And when the saints go marching in, you will be there. Yeah. I will be there. Yeah. Let's come to point number three now. Point number three, our gracious redemption with justification is now to be realized. We're looking at Matthew chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 40. For as Jonas for three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then in verse 41, 41 says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Our gracious redemption, our gracious justification to be realized because of the resurrection of Christ our Lord. We're coming to this on the three perspectives. Number one, our repentance and faith in the Savior. Number two, our righteousness and freedom through the sanctifier. Number three, our redemption and fitness through his sufficiency. Look at number one. Number one, our repentance and faith in the Savior. In Acts chapter 20, reading there from verse 20. Acts chapter 20, reading there from verse 20, how I kept nothing back, nothing, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you, 
and I've taught you publicly and from house to house privately in Basuncha 1, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, both to the Jews and also to the Gentiles, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle said by the Spirit, that is profitable unto you. That is profitable unto the Jews. That is profitable unto the Gentiles. That is profitable unto the people that lived then and unto the people who are living now. What, are, what is that? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Those two things, our repentance, our faith, in the Savior. Look at chapter 26 and verse 20. In chapter 26, verse 20, but showed forth unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. That's profitable. That because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're going to be partakers of the benefits of that resurrection, we repent, we turn away from everything that's against the will of God, the word of God, the way of the Lord, and then we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that we have the salvation of the Lord, the justification, the conversion, and the transformation of our lives. Look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at our righteousness and freedom through the sanctifier. Our righteousness and freedom through the sanctifier. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 8, Rom verse 6. Romans 6, 6. It tells us, it says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Our old man is crucified with him. You know, there is no community faith. You know, there is no continental faith. It's personal faith. My old man is crucified with him. The old man, the old creature with old, with old nature, with old habit, with old dispensation, with old leanings, and with old uh, depravity, and the old, old things pulling us down. It says now that old man with all the old propensities and tendencies, all that old man is crucified with sin. Why? That the body of sin might be destroyed. Not only subdued, not managed, not tolerated, not controlled, not restricted. The old man, the body of sin, not restrained, destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And let nobody say that's impossible. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ was possible, then a crucifixion with him, our death with him, our resurrection with him, our righteousness through him, our sanctification through him, our holiness, holiness of heart through him is a great possibility. And then it says in verse 7, look at verse 7, it says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. In Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20 there, Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. He knew that. How did he know that? He knew that by personal consecration. I submit that whole self unto Christ. I submit that old man unto Christ. And I want that old man to be crucified with him. He knew that. He said, I am crucified with Christ by personal consecration. Number two, by personal 
conviction. The Spirit of God came to bear witness in his heart. Yes, the old man of yours is crucified with him. Number three, by personal experience. I realize now the way I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to think, I think that no more. The strength and the restriction I had inside me before, I had that no more. And the uprising of the ugly head of the depraved nature is not rising like that anymore. By consecration, by conviction, by experience, I know I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul, what do you mean by that? He gave up his life that I might realize that life. He gave up his authority that I might have that authority. He gave up all the possibilities of deity in his incarnation that I might have the possibilities in Christ and of Christ and through Christ. He said he loved me and he gave himself for me. I pray there will be a realization of sanctification by the sanctifier in every one of our lives, in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, yeah. look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at our redemption. Our redemption and fitness through his sufficiency. Whatever we're going through, whatever our need Whatever our desires, he has the sufficiency. And it's sufficient for us. Salvation is a sufficiency. Sanctification is a sufficiency. Righteousness is a sufficiency. Redemption is a sufficiency. And the quickening of a mortal body, the killing of a mortal body is a sufficiency. And miracles that we need, miracles of a supernatural provision, he is our sufficiency. This, our sufficiency, has given us the fitness and the redemption. Now, fitness fitness for the kingdom, fitness for his service, and fitness for all the calling he has given us. We can no more say, like Moses, I cannot, I'm a stammerer. He is a sufficiency, and he makes us fit. We can no more say, like a Jeremiah, I'm only a child, I cannot talk. He is a sufficiency, and he makes us fit. We cannot say, like David, who am I that I should do that? We can no more say that because he makes us fit, and he is our sufficiency and he gives us full redemption. And I pray that everything God accomplished, Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary will become yours in Jesus' name. You will run the whole length of the race he has given you to run. You'll climb every mountain he set before you to climb. And you will do everything he has called you to do because he is all sufficient for you. And he makes us fit and he redeems us. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 12, giving thanks Unto the Father which has made us meet, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Look at verse 13. In verse 13 it says, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? Amen there. Yeah. You are delivered from the power of darkness. Amen again. Yeah. We're not seeking to be delivered. We're delivered already. And all it takes is to stretch out the hand of faith and say, Lord, I receive. Lord, I accept. You did that for me, and I know it is for me. I 
and delivered. It's not a future thing. It's what he has paid for and we realize it now. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Has translated us from oppression. Has translated us from the wickedness of, of the earth. He has translated us from all the negative things that suppress the people of old. And now we're translated into the kingdom of his dear son. I am free. I am delivered. I am set free. <laughs> you know, I had somebody and he said, I can't say that in the public. Pastor, I said, why? If I say that, Satan will hear. I said, and so what? If Satan hears, then all those things, good things I say, he will refuse it. I say, but I say it in the public. He said, yes, because you're a pastor. I said, no, it's not because I'm a pastor. Can I tell you the reason why I say that? I say that because God will hear. Amen. Christ will hear. Amen. The Holy Spirit will hear. And the Trinity will come together and they'll fight. Even if Satan hears, they'll fight against Satan and they'll make Satan to be on the run. In your life, Satan will be on the run. Yeah. Whatever he has heard, you see, you know, what can he do with that? God has heard. Christ has heard. And the Holy Ghost has heard. And because the divine trinity has heard, it will be so in your life in Jesus' name. I am delivered from the power of darkness. And I have been translated into his dear kingdom. And then into the kingdom of his dear son. And then in verse 14, it says in whom we have, not that we're going to have, today, today, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. What's the consequence of that? That you are delivered? What's the consequence of that? That Christ died for you and that he rose again? The consequence is found in Ephesians chapter 3, looking at verse 20 there. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 20. It tells us there now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I want you to change the us there to me and make it personal because if it's not you, if it's not me, then there's no us. If she is not there and you are not there, there is no us. If it is for us, then it is for you, it is for me, it is for us. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or think according to the power that worketh in me. Again, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or seek according to the power that worketh in me. It's about to happen. Look at verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church. Your life will bring glory in the church. Answers to a prayer will bring glory in the church. Your ministry will bring glory in the church. It says unto him, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. As the world ended yet, as the world ended yet, this glory, this power, this manifestation will continue on and on even to the very end and while you are alive you will taste of that glory yeah. you will manifest that glory remember Jesus Christ reaffirmed the story of Jonah remember Jesus Christ revealed his own resurrection and remember Jesus Christ 
also has it on record that that resurrection will work in your life. And it will start right now. Amen. Where are you? In your life. Amen. In your ministry. Amen. In your family. Amen. Rise up now and have the manifestation, the demonstration of the goodness of God and of that resurrection power working afresh and working anew in your life. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up, rise up. Are you in the Galico? Rise up. Are you in Yola? Rise up. What are you? Are you are you in Joss? Rise up. Are you in Kosiva? Rise up. Are you in Yo? Rise up. America, rise up. This is the best place to be. This period. This critical period. This troublous era. The best place to be is in these four days. Global church workers conference, the media edition. Let's thank God for this series. It's a series I said yesterday to end on Sunday. Thank him for this vision. Thank him for this divine revelation. Thank him for this man of God that will take us through this experience of Jonah to the present era. Let's worship God now. Thank him for the dream of, the, of this man of God. Thank you for this pastor, the global pastor, Dr. Kumui. Let's worship God now. For this revelation this morning, you can't get it anywhere, anywhere else. This is the best place to be. What are you now? What are you? Are you in Africa? Are you, are you in Australia? What are you? Are you in America? Are you, are, what are you? Are you in Nigeria? South, 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 West? What are you? Rise up and thank God for this program. Let's worship in the name of the Lord. The new realization of the old revelation. That's a wonder. The great reclamation of Jonah reaffirmed by Jesus. Look at that. Every event will lead to, to, a, to your recovery. God prepared a way to capture Jonah. He knew and he came to rescue him.